go ahead and get started this morning on one of my favorite topics, uh, cochlear implantation. Uh, I want to design this talk to give an overview of kind of the history, where we are in future directions for things. And so uh, starting off first, uh, I don't have any financial in interests or disclosures. So um, why does this matter? Well, cochlear implants are truly the first bionic sense organ that we have um, available for patients. If you lose your vision, if you lose your smell, if you lose your taste, there's really not something that we can do to get that back. But for hearing, we have cochlear implants. I believe that they've had a truly massive impact on our specialty. Um, severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss has a absolutely massive socioeconomic impact. If you take a look at workforce productivity, approximately 2.5 billion, with a B, dollars are lost every year. $2 billion are spent in equal access for the hearing impaired. And prior to the coronavirus epidemic, um, the um, uh, rate of unemployment uh, for uh, people with uh, severe profound sensory neural hearing loss for, who were uh, cochlear implant candidates was approximately 50%. For the general population, that was about 3.7%. Obviously, things have changed, but as um, general unemployment has gone up, uh, those numbers, uh, that ratio will still hold somewhat true. And then if you talk about cost of education, uh, cost of educating a uh, child uh, through deaf education is about 50 times compared to a normal hearing child um, through mainstream. So if we take a look at the early history, um, the first person to really try anything um, with electrical current in the auditory system was Volta in uh, 1790. Amazingly, he took uh, two electric rods, held them between his ears, passed a current, and described a sound that sounded like boiling soup. Um, not the most scientific thing, and thankfully we progressed beyond there. And if we talk about cochlear implantation, there's really three phases. Um, pioneering and kind of experimentation in the 1950s feasibility studies in the 1970s, and then um, subsequently after the 1970s, moving to a commercially viable multi-electrode uh, cochlear prosthesis that's uh, available for pac patients. So there were two Frenchmen, Andre uh, DiGiorno and Charles Ayes, who were the first to be uh, credited with direct cochlear nerve uh, stimulation. This is a, um, uh, what their device looked like. Um, the patient that they decided to place this implant in was a patient who had bilateral uh, cholesteatomas, um, had bilateral temporal bone resections, facial paralysis bilaterally, and uh, dead ears bilaterally following uh, the treatment of this disease. And um, they created this prosthesis. The patient never achieved speech, but at least had sound awareness, interestingly. Um, the, there was an issue with a soldering wire and they had a falling out over presumably whose fault it was and they didn't do any further work. And so um, there was quite, quite a few years where there wasn't really much progress. And then in 1961, uh, Dr. Bill House and Dr. Uh, James Doyle uh, placed a single gold electrode into two different patients. Uh, he was, uh, Doyle was a uh, neurosurgeon in um, the LA area. And interestingly, these two uh, had a disagreement uh, regarding how aggressively to pursue implants, and it led to a disillusion of their partnership. Um, House went on to uh, really pioneer a lot of skull-based procedures, particularly the uh, translabyrinthine approach. And he really focused on these because he didn't feel that the cochlear implant was ready for prime time. Interestingly, Doyle ended up working with another um, ENT and um, you know, the way it shook out, he really didn't have much progress with that. Uh, Dr. House resumed his work in the late 1960s with Jack Urban, who was a famous uh, engineer working at the House Group. And interestingly, in Northern California, there was a oleoregologist, Dr. Robin Mickelson, who experimented with single uh, channel electrodes in the late 1960s. He was recu recruited to uh, UCSF and both these individuals um, reported uh, early work in 1973 at the Academy meeting in uh, St. Louis. So um, 73 was a very significant year in the development of cochlear implantation. Uh, both House and Mickelson were far from the mainstream. They were doing all of this with private funding. And if we think about that now of uh, someone being in clinic, um, in clinical practice and saying, you know what, I'm gonna develop this implant, and I'm going to talk to patients about it. we're going to place it is pretty amazing. Um, 
you know, it's one of those things that just wouldn't happen the way it happened then, now. And so um, the NIH uh, oversaw criteria for implantation um, and delineated this in 1974. And this was part of taking it from a um, experimental private situation to more mainstream. So patients had to have informed consent regarding the experimental nature, profound sensory neural hearing loss. They had mandatory psychologic testing. It was adults only. This led to the Bilger Report in 1975, which demonstrated uh, cochlear implant benefit for implanted patients. And so these are some of what the early um, implants looked like. This was the house 3M single electrode implant. This was the uh, early Mickelson implant, which later became AB. This is actually a picture of the first sound processor for cochlear. Uh, that's a room. So something that now fits either behind the ear or an off the ear uh, sound processor um, used to take up the size of a room, uh, which is pretty amazing. And this is one of the earlier cochlear um, implant recipients. Um, they, the early ones had actually a microphone that people would speak into, and then they had a body-worn processor um, that looked uh, reminiscent of a satchel, and then the actual implant um, up here. And so that technology has really progressed over the years, has become um, much more efficient um, and much more effective while getting smaller in size. Um, so if we have a question about the cost effectiveness um, of cochlear implants, this is very important because implants are expensive. If you take a look at how much an implant costs, opening it up um, is about $30,000. That doesn't include any kind of uh, cost as far as the surgery, testing, all those kinds of things. And so ultimately, if we're going to do something, we need to know that it is a cost-effective option for patients. So if you take a look at um, studies, you look at quality-adjusted uh, life years, and so they demonstrate that they're a very cost-effective intervention, that they are on par or more effective than cardiac defibrillators and knee replacement, which is huge. And um, it's one of those things that as you see these patients and take care of these patients, it can really open up their lives. Um, I have one patient who um, was college educated, lost their hearing, and was unemployed. They were able to undergo implantation, and now they're back working, and they were in their late 30s. Um, that's a huge, huge, huge um, fiscal consideration um, with taking a look at things. So the other thing, and in, in, um, this was something that was very important with the early implants was reliability. You need to be effective and it need to be reliable. It doesn't matter if you do fantastic with something, if it's always broken all the time, it's not going to last. And so the long and short of it is that the implants are overall very, very, very reliable. You're looking at 99, 98% over years. What we tell patients is, is that this is designed to be a lifetime device, regardless of the patient's age, whether they're 93 or whether they're less than one. The reality is, is that it is a device and there's always the potential risk for uh, need to replace it or revision, but overall they're designed to be a lifetime device. So there's three uh, uh, implant companies that are currently uh, FDA approved, Cochlear, Advanced Bionics, and Medel. Um, I tell my patients it's basically like Chevy Ford and Dodge when it comes to pickup trucks. Um, they all have their different bells and whistles uh, related to them, but they're all uh, good, they're all safe, they're all effective. Um, and it's one of those things that oftentimes patients will look there and go, I like this feature about this company or that. Ultimately, there's no study that shows benefit um, over one company to the other. So the traditional um, cochlear implant components contain uh, an external uh, part and then an internal part. So the external part is a, uh, a sound processor and then a component to get it to the internal stimuli receiver. So this can be an off the ear, which has been most commonly used. So this part sits right here as the sound processor. And then this is where the uh, magnet sits. The magnet um, um, communicate or you know, form, forms the magnetic force with the magnet in the stimulator receiver. And that allows the um, sounds that are turned into an electrical signal to be passed to the internal component. Um, Medel and Cochlear have an off the ear sound processor that's also available for patients to use. Some patients really, really like having an off the ear. Interestingly, I found that a lot of patients like the on the ear sound processor. 
I think a lot of that's because a lot of them have been hearing aids for years and it's probably quite similar to like wearing a watch. If you don't have that sensation, it feels very odd. So just a quick video about how cochlear implants work. Sound comes in. The sound processor takes that uh, uh, sound, turns it into an electrical signal, sends it to the simulator receiver. They actually don't light up like that in real life, but the signal gets sent to the electrode. The electrode array stimulates, and then that uh, leads to simulation of the auditory nerve. And so the key components is that you have to have a cochlea, you have to have a cochlear nerve, and you have to have a, a, um, a processing source, the brain. If you've got those three components, then there's a, co a chance for a cochlear implantation. So a hybrid or EAS cochlear implant is a cochlear implant that has been developed to take advantage of patients that uh, traditionally had not been cochlear implant candidates. Um, we'll talk about the criteria, but um, initially you had to be absolutely no hearing, no benefit from hearing aids in order to get an implant. Ultimately, those people were good implant candidates, but we found that there's lots of patients that have poor word discrimination and don't do well with hearing aids. Those patients um, uh, benefit from using a hybrid um, cochlear implant where they have an acoustic component and then they also have the electric component. So these are patients that have good low frequency hearing, which are able to utilize the acoustic component to take care of um, hearing with the low frequencies, which helps uh, with their overall performance. So when we talk about electrode design, um, we take a look back over 50 years and those electrodes have evolved significantly. There's been three forces that drive the evolution in this design. So you, we developed multi-channel simulation, which allows for superior discrimination compared to single channel. The placement of an electrode closer to the mandialis, allowing for uh, better spatial specificity. And then atriumac and precise uh, placement in the scale of timpani, which I believe has been absolutely critical. And so it's one of those things that initially, if we take a look, there was a very quick and immediate rise in the number of cochlear implant electrodes, or the number of arrays on the electrode, excuse me. But we'll see that those have really stayed pretty constant since the 1980s. And it's interesting, it kind of gets to the point where you don't need to have hundreds of electrodes on an array, or a hundred of arrays on electrodes. Um, what we end up finding is that you have the, the um, electrodes on the array, and we're finding that programming can be absolutely key in getting patients the best result. And sometimes that means turning off a particular electrode. So there's a number of different uh, uh, electrode designs. This goes through cochlear, medel, and advanced bionics. These really fall into two kind of broad categories, perimedialar, which really hug the medialis, and then lateral wall electrodes. Ultimately, it's one of those things that um, each have their pros and cons, pluses and minuses to them. A lot of it comes down to um, surgeon preference, uh, programming preference. Ultimately, there's not one that's been shown to be better than the other. Um, cochlear makes both uh, perimedialar and lateral wall electrodes. Medell's electrode portfolio is uh, primarily lateral wall. And the advanced bionics has um, some mid-scale of perimedialar and lateral wall electrodes. And I think that ultimately it's one of those things that um, there's certain patients that need a certain electrode and there's not one size that fits all. So the internal components, this is just a couple pictures uh, showing them. This is an advanced biox internal device, a nickel for size comparison of how thin they are. This is a uh, cochlear uh, six series implant, um, a medal, and then the actual array with the platinum electrodes right there. And so um, this is the initial nucleus, uh, cochlear nucleus hybrid electrode. The idea being is that there was a very short electrode that stimulated the basal turn of the cochlea, but didn't extend further into the cochlea to preserve those hearing elements there. So one of the things that you may read about are split electrodes. These are designed for uh, particularly uh, post meningitic patients who have ossification or fibrosis. Um, it's one of those things that oftentimes read about, but um, often don't come into practice. 
on use, but like to uh, have that picture just for everyone's edification. So a quick comment on coding. Um, so a uh, speech coding strategy defines a method in which the pitch, loudness, and timing of sound are translated into a series of the electrical impulses. That can be simultaneous, non-simultaneous. Simultaneous. Um, all three devices in the US are capable of using more than one type of strategy. This is the magic that the audiologists make happen. Um, so I just like to touch on it, but I'm not gonna delve into the intricacies of that. So when we talk about patients who are cochlear implant candidates, um, there's obviously the preoperative evaluation. So um, your history and physical, the key with that is the oologic history and audiologic history. Um, oftentimes these are patients with a slowly progressive sensory neural hearing loss, don't have a lot of oologic history. Um, ultimately though, these are patients that can have a history of acuitis media, chronic otitis media, they can have a history of Meniere's disease, they can have any of these things. Um, these are all important things because it can change your imaging, it can change your approach, it can change um, uh, your counseling for the patient. I think that the duration of hearing loss and amplification use can all be very important. If you have someone who was postlingually deafened, used hearing aids for years and years and years and years has slowly lost benefit from them, um, then that's someone that overall they should do well with cochlear implantation because they've used amplification over those years. Um, someone that hasn't used hearing aids at all and comes in and says, I want a cochlear implant. Well, you know, um, it may be worthwhile having them do a hearing aid trial just so they can get a baseline and set reasonable expectations um, with those and we'll kind of cross that bridge. Um, key component to this is audiologic candidacy. Um, if a patient's hearing is too good, a patient's hearing is too good. Um, so there's specifically an audiologic evaluation that patients undergo, obviously, but then also a formal cochlear implant evaluation. Um, medically, the patient has to be able to tolerate the surgery. So for a young, healthy person with no medical problems, that operative risk is quite small. Um, for other patients, that may be higher, and that's a discussion um, that's individualized to each patient. Um, there is no age restriction for cochlear implantation. Studies have shown that older patients do well. Um, my oldest patient um, was 93 when he was in, 94 when he was implanted. He was still working on no medications. He was one of those things that uh, he wanted to continue working and keep moving forward from there. I think that's absolutely reasonable. And obviously we'll talk about the FDA criteria for pediatric implantation and also off-label for doing younger. Um, radiologic evaluation that can be CT or MRI depending on history and what information you want to know. Um, psychologic evaluation, which I touched on previously, is, oft, is not a um, every uh, candidate evaluation. Um, it's oftentimes now reserved for special populations or if there's a concern. And then the last component is, is which ear to implant. Um, and we'll touch on all that. So the adult criteria um, are, are postlingually deafened adults. Um, the FDA is a moderate to severe profound sensory neural hearing loss. Um, appropriate trial of hearing aids and aided performance on open set uh, sentence testing, 60% are poor bilaterally, 50% are poor on the ear to be implanted. Uh, for Medicare patients, um, aided performance on open set testing must be 40% or less. So for Medicare patients, um, they have to do worse to get an implant. Um, this becomes important when talking about patients um, because it's one of those things if someone's going to switch to Medicare and they're a candidate um, prior to Medicare, then they may not switch into Medicare. And I've had patients, you know, uh, wait or work a little bit longer to get their implants. I do know that there's been um, studies trying to um, take a look at this and, and look at benefit. Um, they're currently ongoing uh, for that patient population. The open sentence testing uses AZ Bio and HINT, which is hearing and noise testing. And so going back to that hybrid um, patient in that, um, what we we're talking about. So in the old days, it was that patients had to do poor across the board. And the problem is, is that presbycusis or hearing loss that comes with wisdom is typically high frequency loss with low frequency relative preservation. And so a problem would happen where patients would do well in the lows, but then do very poorly in the highs. And they would have 
poor word discrimination and they would be very poor hearing aid candidates. They would be very unhappy, wouldn't do well with them, wouldn't have a lot of problems. This hits pr particularly close to home for me because I have a family member who fit that profile and had hearing aids for years and had a lot of difficulties with it. And so the expansion of cochlear implant um, um, criteria has allowed for patients to be implanted before they're just truly, truly struggling. So for hybrid criteria, patients um, are normal to low, uh, mild low frequency with a precipitous hearing loss in the highs, pure tone average at two, three, and 4,000 hertz at 60 dB or poorer. Um, aided performance with CNC word list single words is 10 to 60% in the ear to be implanted or 80 or poor in the contralateral ear. So quite an expansion um, with that. And so these were in what I typically tell patients is, um, I see patients that will fall into the hyper criteria um, or qualify for a cochlear implant in general, but they're doing well with their hearing aids and they're not having any problems. If that's the case, then I tell them keep using the hearing aids. Um, you know, it's always something that if we hit that point that you're having trouble, we can take a look at it. So pediatric criteria are significantly different than adults. Um, what we find is that um, the current FDA guidelines are severe, profound, centurial hearing loss bilaterally, uh, be at least 12 months old at the time of implant, have limited benefit from hearing aids. Um, so ultimately, you can do um, implants younger than 12 months. Um, that's off, um, um, off guideline. Uh, and also, uh, there are more, more and more consideration in movement to implant single-sided hearing loss patients or hear, uh, hearing preservation um, with them. I think the most important thing when we talk about uh, pediatric cochlear implantation is that there's a huge family commitment. Uh, cochlear implantation is not, you get the surgery, you get the implant, and then it's done. Um, you, people need a good surgery, but the real hard work comes after the implantation. Uh, patients have to be committed to that rehabilitation to learn to hear, and that's where they're going to get the best result. And so for adults, that's setting reasonable expectations that it's not a quick fix. For pediatric patients, obviously, that one-year-old can't drive themselves to an appointment. They can't drive themselves to speech pathology. And so the family has to be truly committed for that. Um, and I think the one thing that everyone who does pediatric cochlear implants you know, kind of their worst fear is implanting a patient and then the patient just disappears and they never show up or anything. Thankfully, um, my experience has been that um, families are truly committed and invested in it. And um, it takes truly a village to get that child hearing and they, they work with that step by step. And so I think that um, the other key point to that is, is um, uh, reliable testing. Um, for pediatric patients that means having a reliable um, ABR and feeling confident in the hearing evaluation that you have before proceeding forward with an implantation. And so if we take a look at the evolution of implantation, if we go back to 1985, um, only adults who were postlingually deafened, who were profound, were implant candidates. With your best hearing aids in the best condition, if you got one word right out of 100, you were not a cochlear implant candidate. That's a pretty isolating uh, situation uh, for patients. Um, that's something where, you know, they're really not able to function in the setting of background noise and they're really restricted toward lip reading. If we move forward to 1990, um, adults and children over the age of two um, were candidates. So postlingually deafened adults and pre and post lingually deafened children. The degree of hearing loss had to be profound. The adult open set speeches had to be zero and the pediatric speech scores had to be zero. So if you were to, you know, um, we're 20 years uh, in front of this now, say, well, we're gonna wait until a child's two, they have to be profound with 0%, um, there would be some pushback for that and rightfully so. And if we move forward to 1998, it's adults, children over the age of 18 months. And then the adults were severe, profound. Children were profound. Um, adults, 40% open set, and then 20% for pediatric patients. And then currently it's adult children over, um, more than 12 months for FDA criteria. Um, and so um, 
what we've seen is that we've uh, progressively expanded the criteria for implantation. I think it's important that we do this in a very scientific and thoughtful manner. We don't want to just be implanting people that don't need a cochlear implant, but at the same time, if patients are struggling and they're losing that quality of life, in addition to the, now the neurocognitive concerns that come up with hearing loss, um, I think that that's important to keep in mind. So if we talk about preoperative imaging, um, you know, this assumes that the patient's a candidate, they're able to tolerate the surgery. And so the question becomes, okay, do, we, do you want imaging and what imaging do you want? So CT and MRI are distinct imaging modalities, but I think that instead of saying CT or MRI, it, I think the question is, what do you want to know? Um, because CT is great for bone, MRI is great for soft tissue. And if you are concerned about a particular thing, I think one can be better than the other. So for example, if you have a patient with a normal ear history, no considerations as far as otitis media, chronic otitis media, but they have a significant asymmetry between their hearing and their ears, then I think an MRI may be worthwhile because you wanna make sure that they don't have a retrocochlear lesion. And I think uh, a lot of people have had, I know I've had it happen where there's an asymmetry in the ear to be implanted has a small acoustic or a meningioma. And so that kind of changes your gears with it. If they have a bilateral symmetric slowly sensory neural, a slowly progressive sensory neural hearing loss without any other concerns, then a CT can be very, very helpful with that. And so um, I think that it's one of those things that you, you say, what do I want to know? What do I want to look at? If it's a routine patient without any concern for um, um, any kind of asymmetry, then I think uh, getting a CT is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Or if you really want to see the bony anatomy. I mean, there's concern about retrocochlear lesion. Um, if there's concern about um, any kind of uh, fibrosis or ossification of, of the um, uh, cochlea, that can be very, very, very helpful with that. And so when we talk about um, uh, MRIs, I think kind of the big thing is, is that if a patient has had a history of meningitis, the thing that you always worry about is the ossification of fibrosis of the cochlea. And studies have demonstrated that MRI is more sensitive for this because in order for us to see um, the, per, the uh, after effects of meningitis on a CT, there has to be frank ossification. In this case, um, you, can't, that you won't see the fibrosis, but in this particular case, we can see, taking a look right here, that the lateral semicircular canal stops. The cochlea has good signal, but um, what's happened is, is part of this uh, patient's OX cap capsule has fibrosed. And so that leads to a conversation about um, the fact that there's good fluid within the cochlea, um, but you have some concern about progression of disease. You know, and this is something that would be picked up on a CAT scan. So that's where MRI can be particularly, particularly helpful. And so if we talk about um, the risk of meningitis, and this is something that um, interestingly can come up during uh, consultation with patients. So if you take a patient on the street, in a patient with a cochlear implant, technically the cochlear implant recipient has a slightly higher risk of developing meningitis. Overall, that's one out of uh, 1,000. Uh, 1, um, last check, there were about 122 cases of meningitis in CI users in the US over the years. Um, in 2002, there was an issue with the positioner and the American Academy of Head and Neck Surgery uh, supports uh, the CDC recommendation for cochlear implant recipients. And that basic recommendation is that they undergo um, their pneumococcal, pneumococcal vaccination series. I recommend it for um, uh, all my patients, pediatric and adult. Um, the uh, patients over 64 typically have had all that, but it's one of those things I think um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think it's a really reasonable thing um, and I recommend it for all my patients. So psychologic evaluation used to be kind of routine. Now it's used for uh, special populations. Uh, if there's concern um, with any kind of mental health issue, um, any kind of mental disability, um, it's something that can be done. It's not generally done. 
And so uh, if we talk about contraindications for uh, cochlear implantation, if we go back to what's needed for a cochlear implant, if you remember, it's a cochlea, a cochlear nerve, and an active processing source, the brain. So if you have all three of those, they're technically a candidate. So the first contraindication would be is if they're simply too good um, with their hearing. If someone can hear, has normal hearing and they come in and want to talk about cochlear implant, that's a contraindication. Um, another would be active middle ear disease. It's uh, something that uh, you don't want to place a uh, implant of any kind if there's an active infection or anything like that. Um, cochlear malformation, um, really the big thing is, is that if there's a cochlea, um, I think it's reasonable to um, uh, have a discussion on expectations with it. Um, it's interesting when we start talking about cochlear nerve, um, whether or not it's present. Um, the vast majority of uh, patients that are pediatric patients that undergo an auditory brain stem implant will fail a cochlear implant first because the interesting thing is that there are a significant number of patients that don't demonstrate a cochlear nerve on formal MRI, but they're able to get benefit from a cochlear implant. Relative contraindications would be uh, deformities, uh, ossificans, and advanced osclerosis. I think the big thing with these more complex cases is a discussion about expectations with them step by step. So a big question becomes, okay, the patient's a candidate, you've gotten your imaging, which ear do you implant? Um, so dating back to the early days, it was always the uh, worst hearing ear. At some centers, the better hearing ear is selected. The reason being is that there's a higher percentage of neural elements with the possibility of better performance. Um, my personal experience has been that um, the vast majority of patients um, typically want to hang on to their better hearing ear, which is very reasonable. If there's a huge difference between the ears, that's usually pretty night and day, and it's really not too much of a discussion. Um, patients are able to utilize bimodal hearing, which is a hearing aid on the good ear, cochlear implant in the bad ear, and then a lot of the hearing aid, uh, some of the hearing aid and cochlear implant brands are actually compatible with each other, which can be very, very helpful. I think one of the key things when we talk about ear to implant is the duration of deafness and amplification. So 30 years with amplification, 30 years without amplification are different. Um, overall though, it's interesting. Um, I think uh, most people have had patients that um, have a long duration of deafness and don't use amplification and you have a honest conversation with them and set expectations and they do surprisingly well with their cochlear implant. And so I think it's just something step by step. My general practice is, is to have a conversation with the patient and um, it's generally the worst hearing ear. Um, I haven't had the issue of someone wanting to implant a greatly better hearing ear. Um, but those are just my considerations with things. Of course, there's anatomic considerations um, with them. If there's something that, um, um, you know, makes a huge difference one side versus the other, that would be something to consider. But generally, the worst hearing ear is the ear that's implanted. So um, unilateral and bilateral amplification versus um, uh, implantation. Um, this really used to be a controversial topic. Um, it's not so much now for bilateral cochlear implantation, um, or uh, the other option would be uh, bimodal, where they have a hearing aid in one ear, cochlear implant in the other. So patients that are bilateral listeners benefit from head shadow effect. This becomes especially important in noise. Um, it's interesting where patients oftentimes will know this benefit from their um, bilateral cochlear implantations, hearing and noise. There's also some security if there's a device failure. So um, let's say you have uh, someone who has bilateral cochlear implants and um, they're in a car accident, they have head trauma and one implant goes out. Well, they're still able to hear because they have that contralateral implant. Um, there are some uh, concerns that still exist. So um, it's one concern is using up both ears. So if both ears have an implant, then they've kind of been used. Um, this can be a concern, especially with children with possible future technology. Um, my personal um, uh, thought process with this is that, you know, it's one of those things we're taking a look at um, quality of life for today. And sure, there's potential things 20, 30, 40 years down the road. But if we're talking about speech and language development, 
the time is now to develop that. And, you know, for the patient who's 75 and wanting to get the most out of life, you know, 40 years, it, you know, it could be in the cards for them, but I doubt that they would want to um, sit on possibilities for that. There is the possibility of bilateral vestibular injury with uh, bilateral implantation. And there have been some questions about the cost effectiveness of bilateral implantation. So um, one of the mainstays have been that if you have a cochlear implant, getting an MRI is either completely off limits or not possible. Um, there's four possible interactions between MRIs and cochlear implants. There's the possibility of movement of the stimulator receiver or the electrode array, uh, generation of noxious or injurious auditory stimuli, generation of heat or demagnetization. Um, now all three companies have uh, MR compatible um, magnets. And so the first company was Medel and Cochlear and AB all have uh, magnets that have um, different kinds of technology that allow patients to get MRIs without either removing the magnet or having to have a, a significant uh, splint or head wrap um, that keeps the magnet from moving. And so what this picture shows is a patient who had a um, uh, sudden hearing loss on one side and had a CP angle lesion on the other. And so um, what we show with this picture is the distortion that comes from the magnet being in place. Um, there are um, some cases with the MR compatible um, uh, devices that the magnet needs to be removed if there's very specific things that need to be seen on a brain MRI. Um, but things are greatly, greatly better than what they were 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so when we talk about the surgical procedure, it's performed uh, generally under general anesthesia, patient placed in the oologic position. Prophylactic antibiotics are given. There's no uh, double blind study to justify the efficacy of preoperative antibiotics, but they're universally given. Um, skin incision has varied over the years. It used to be a much larger skin incision um, a lot of people today use a postauricular incision. Um, the nice thing about a smaller incision is, is it gives you the access that you need, but you cut down on the amount of wound to heal because one of the big issues that, um, I wouldn't say a big issue, but one of the more common complications years ago were wound issues. And with an implant, the last thing you want is to have it um, exposed or extruded in any way. And so a smaller incision, keeping the implant off the incision can be very helpful with that. So this is a patient um, with a right ear um, in surgical position, and this shows kind of the postauricular incision if you want to have a little limb, and then where the stimulator receiver will be positioned. So if we talk about the surgical procedure itself, um, mastoidectomy with a facial recess is the um, uh, standard procedure for it. The mastoidectomy provides a route to get to the facial recess. The facial recess is opened and the round window is, is visualized with that. One of the key things that I find to be important for this is the identification of the stapes. If there are a lot of um, uh, air cells around the cochlea, sometimes when that facial recess gets opened, you can go, okay, there's, there's the, the round window niche. And I think that the, having the stapes in view with the round window niche is absolutely important. If you are seeing the round window niche and you don't see the stapes in the same high power view, it's not the round window niche. That uh, relationship is very, very conserved and very, very important. Um, if they've had a stapes previously, you look for the prosthesis. But um, visualizing the round window, whether it's using a round window insertion or a cochleostomy, um, is important um, for scale of tympany insertion. And then using these stapes to help identify that is very important. So after we've visualized our round window in this particular procedure, um, the round window niche is drilled away for a, um, a uh, round window insertion. Um, people may develop subperiosteal pockets or they may um, um, do fixation. I think it's one of those things that comes down to um, particular preference. After the um, dummy is removed, um, in this particular case, some tie-down sutures are created um, to help keep the uh, device and electrodes in place. So this is the uh, implant going into the subperiosteal pocket. There's a grounding electrode that is placed superiorly 
And then next will be the actual uh, electrode placement. At this point, the round window is opened up. Um, round window um, insertion it, um, can be great because it helps for placement of the electrode um, within the scale of timpani. Um, and so the key with that is that you want to have an atraumatic insertion, slow insertion. Um, you know, there's different insertion techniques based upon the type of electrode that you have, whether it's a lateral wall electrode, whether it's a styleted electrode that's pairing the dialer. The key is to have a uh, slow atraumatic insertion um, to preserve as much as many neural elements and cochlear structures as possible. Um, fascia and muscle are then uh, packed around the insertion site. At that point, um, implant is in, uh, tie everything up and get the patient closed up. Um, for these particular uh, cases, you know, you always, I think that uh, getting a uh, great closure is really important because the last thing that you ever want to have happen is any kind of a wound issue or anything like that. So um, a question becomes of intraoperative testing, the cochlear implants in, what would you like to do? Is there any testing or imaging that could be obtained? And the answer to that is yes. So this can vary from practice to practice um, and situation to situation. But just for discussion purposes, um, the two things that can be um, looked at are impedances and then electrically evoked compound action potentials. So impedances are a function of the array itself and resistive characteristics of fluid or tissue surrounding each electrode provides information about electrode integrity in the tissue interface. The um, um, ECAPs are commonly known as NRT, ART, um, and uh, NRT, I believe, uh, based on the com company terminology, electrically stimulates the auditory nerve using the electrode to generate um, an ECAP. The key about this is that these uh, compound action potentials um, are not solely specific to the auditory nerve. So if you happen to have an electrode that um, is someplace else, if you will, um, then and it stimulates the facial nerve, you'll get a compound uh, action potential associated with that. But that tells us some intraoperative text, testing that can be quite helpful. If there's concern um, with placement, um, in my practice, if it's a pediatric patient, we'll get a um, x-ray in the room that allows us to see the electrode um, going into the cochlea and having a good placement with it. Um, you know, it's one of those things, um, there's different um, approaches to things. I think ultimately um, doing something consistently um, in doing something that you're comfortable with is the most important thing. So early complications, facial nerve injury, thankfully, is very rare. Um, the more common things that we see or uh, that we can see are wound infection, wound dehiscence. Um, CSF leak is something that can be seen at the time of surgery, and, there and there's oftentimes anatomic considerations that will give you um, uh, an idea that that may be the case. Um, early device failure, um, some patients may notice a little bit of balance disturbance and then meningitis. Um, layer complications can be extrusion and exposure of the device. Um, I, I believe in being very aggressive in managing that because I believe if, if the device is exposed long enough, something uh, not good is going to happen. Um, persistent postoperative pain is likely a form of po uh, periosteitis and responds well to NSAIDs. You can have displacement or migration of the device, late device failure. Um, these patients undergo a systematic check to determine the cause um, prior to reimplantation. Um, otitis media, meningitis, uh, as other uh, late complications. And so taking a look at special surgical considerations, um, the hearing preservation technique or soft surgery has been very key. Um, this has led to uh, a change in surgery. Um, it's identification of the round window membrane with either a round window insertion or appropriate uh, cochleostomy. Um, once that round window niche is drilled off and the round window is opened or the cochleostomy performed, no suctioning or pairing limb from the scale of tympany with a slow electrode insertion. Um, I personally do a hearing preservation approach every time. Um, depending, regardless of their hearing, just because um, repetition is, can be a very good thing overall. Um, some uh, folks drill a well for the electrode, for the implant. Some just play a, a, place a subperiosteal pocket. Um, I think as long as you do the same thing every time and have a consistently good result, I think that's natural variation. 
Um, some are strong advocates for fixation, fixating the implant, which can be uh, excellent. And then there are spe specific uh, complex cases. Some of these can be otitis media. Um, the concern with placing a cochlear implant is that in a contaminated inflamed uh, environment, that there's going to be disease that either goes into the labyrinth or the implant getting infected. Um, the most common strategy is to deal with the chronic disease, stage the implant and go from there. Taking a look at labyrinth isocyphicans, um, so this is ossification following meningitis. So 5% of children with bacterial meningitis develop profound sensory neural hearing loss and up to 36% of adults and 35% of children demonstrate some degree of obliteration of their cochlea. So infection spreads from the cochlear aqueduct into the subarachnoid of the labyrinth. It occurs worse than first at the basal end of the scale of tympany close to the round window, and this is where getting a MRI can be helpful to tell how much um, fibrosis or ossification there is. So on the CT scan, we can see that there has been ossification there, but you can bet that there's more fibrosis if there's that much ossification. So that's where MRI can be helpful in taking a look at these kinds of things and telling us if there's fibrosis as opposed to uh, um, ossification. The thing that we look for is to see good T2 signal within the cochlea. So um, there's a number of strategies. Um, basically, it comes down to how much ossification is there. If it's within the round window niche only, that's something that can be done easier. Um, if it's through the inferior segment or, ex or extending, it becomes progressively more difficult. There's a number of strategies of drilling, drilling these out using um, angiocath catheters to try to dilate and get an electrode through. Um, ultimately, your goal is to get a full insertion um, ultimately, it may be one of those things that may be an incomplete insertion, and that's where I think that having your imaging to have the discussion to the patient or the patient's family prior to implantation is very important. So um, the most common form of non-auditory stimulation associated with cochlear implantation is spatial nerve stimulation. Um, depending if you've got osclerosis or osteogenesis imperfecta, this may be more common. Um, it's a very common question for the uh, in-service and board, so the answer is not to take out the implant, not to turn off the implant, but to decrease the offending electrode. So oftentimes they can just decrease the stimulation on the electrode and that will take care of it. If that doesn't take care of it, they'll turn off the electrode and that will oftentimes take care of it. So if we talk about results, um, what I tell patients is generally patients who need a cochlear implant and are committed to the rehabilitation following implantation do better. What does that mean? Well, most postlingually definite adults will get open set word recognition. Um, children who receive implants and undergo intensive therapy generally do well. Um, and implants allow, have the ability to allow children to recover a normal ability to acquire speech and language. However, that does not overcome the detrimental effects of early auditory deprivation. And so that's key in identification of children. The other key for adults is, is that we're finding more and more um, links in correlation between hearing loss and neurocognitive decline. So that's another important consideration. So when we talk about hybrids, there's a concern of where the long-term implications for it. Um, we're starting to get long-term data, but we don't have 20 and 30 year data. If a really short electrode array is used, will it be long enough if or when that patient's hearing changes? Um, you know, people have varying opinions with that. Um, a number of people use the, elect the uh, short, very short hybrid electrodes. Um, within my practice, I'll use a soft array uh, for hearing preservation cases like a Flex24 or a 622 um, and uh, have had, knock on wood, generally uh, good results with hearing preservation, but still giving patients cochlear coverage. But again, it's a conversation. It's an area of future study. I think that um, depending on where you train, there will be different uh, thoughts and opinions. And so future directions, um, and this is where I think it gets really exciting, is not only the expansion of criteria for patients with bilateral hearing loss, but also patients with tinnitus, single side uh, deafness, the utilization of intraoperative monitoring, such as ECOG, implantation of patients with a retrocochlear lesion history, and then robotics and implantation. So for tinnitus, um, it's one of the most common symptoms seen. Um, etiology is complex and incompletely understood. 
Um, with restoring appropriate signal from the cochlea with electrical stim, um, this can be an effective treatment. Um, we've seen that um, implantation of patients with hearing loss that have tinnitus and no tinnitus suppression. Um, it's one of those things that I think that having um, an appropriately um, appropriate audiologic candidate in that patient with appropriate uh, expectations is very, very, very important for these uh, kinds of patients. Um, you know, if I tell patients, if we can get you just a little bit of benefit uh, for the tinnitus, but improvement in hearing loss, you know, would you be happy if they say, yeah, I think it's always a reasonable thing to move forward from there. Um, because ultimately it's different for everyone. And, you know, you want to, uh, I always believe in uh, underselling and overperforming um, um, one area that I'm particularly uh, interested in is single-sided deafness. Um, the mainstay has been a cross-hearing aid or an osteointegrated device. And, uh, um, investigation for single-sided deafness has been ongoing, and studies demonstrate benefit in speech comprehension, location ability, better speech recognition, and noise, and going back to that reduced tinnitus. Um, my single-sided deafness patients, um, again, who have very reasonable expectations, have all been very happy with it. Um, and notice a huge improvement with it, um, with things. I also had one patient who lost their hearing in one ear, um, didn't want to go doing a hearing restoration, which is reasonable. They were young in their 20s. And then 10 months later, lost all the hearing in their other ear. Everything was stone cold normal, and imaging, lab testing, no vertigo, anything like that. Ended up being a bilateral concurrent um, uh, implantation has done exceptionally well, but it's just one of those things that we don't know what the future holds for patients. So in conclusion, um, cochlear implants are absolutely revolutionary for patients. They have the ability to restore hearing for affected patients. They're safe, they're cost-effective, and dependable with a consistent um, uh, possibility of result. I tell patients that it's always um, different depending for each patient. Um, everyone's going to have a different journey with their cochlear implant. Some people take off like rockets. Some people take time. Generally speaking, people do better with a cochlear implant than they do prior to. The key thing is, is that they have reasonable expectations and are committed to that rehabilitation. There's ever-evolving technology and ever-expanding indications. Earlier pediatric implantation with consideration of hearing preservation and single-sided implantation single side uh, implantation overall in tinnitus. Um, and just from a personal note, because I think that those things can always be helpful, I have a family member who had bilateral, slowly progressive sensory neural hearing loss. They worked on a farm, military, all those different kinds of things. And they retired due to the fact that they couldn't hear and their speech discrimination was quite poor. Um, they worked in a profession where mishearing something had um, huge implications for their clients. And it was one of those things that um, they retired because they were afraid of making a mistake. Um, that family member has undergone bilateral sequential uh, cochlear implantation. And it's one of those things that for years couldn't pick up the phone and talk to them. Now I can pick up the phone, talk to them, have a conversation. And, you know, family members aren't on the other end um, playing um, interpreter. I think that that's one of those things that can have a huge improvement for quality of life for patients. And I'm probably biased, but I think one of the coolest things that we can do. I think that's all I have. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, stay safe, be well, and I'll take any questions.